There we go, full screen. Thank you, Lewis. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to start out with this quote. Uh, you may be deceived if you trust too much, but you will live in torment if you don't trust enough. Um, this quote is from the 1890s, so a little bit earlier than all of the computing history that Kat just covered. So I don't think it was written about open source. But after working in open source and security for the last couple of years, it's hard to see this any other way. Um, this really expresses the dichotomy that a lot of us are faced with today. Um, if you build on open source, you are trusting the software from thousands of people on the internet that you have never met. If you spent five minutes on the internet, that's a scary premise, because not everyone on the internet is a nice person. Um, but if you want to develop modern software today, you have to do that. There is no real choice other than developing software on top of open source. Open source is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Um, unfortunately, uh, we're facing a crossroads in open source today, where attackers are starting to notice all of this implicit trust that we've placed in this code. All of these libraries, every package, every open source project, every maintainer that you build on top of, uh, they're under attack today because attackers have realized how much trust that we place in all of these people. Uh, regulators in both, the Euro in both Europe and in the United States are noticing this too, how dangerous this all is. And they're crafting regulations that are frankly terrifying for anybody that's worked in this space. Um, so there's a lot of different things hitting open source now creating friction. Um, if you're in the DevOps space and now you've heard the DevSecOps buzzword, um, open source is all about implicit trust and the ability to build on top of people like this that you've never met. The ability to leverage that scary CNCF landscape diagram. Um, all of that. Uh, but if you're from the security space, you probably heard the term zero trust, right? The whole security mindset is uh, against trusting people like this, especially when you have no reason to trust them. Um, so in this talk, I'm hoping to cover that change a little bit, that friction that everyone is being faced with today, um, as well as how a lot of this has been solved before. Open source has been around for a while. These problems aren't new. We've faced similar ones in the past. And so we'll look at how we've gotten through some of these trust problems before, and hopefully can scale them into the future as well. Um, so I'm going to start out with that, talking a little bit about the history of trust, so how we've done trust in the past. I'm only, only going back to like the early 1980s, so not quite as far back as the 60s, uh, but that's when open source really started to take off. Um, after that, I'll talk a little bit about that gap that we're facing today. So we've had trust systems in place for open source before. They just aren't working at the scale that we're working at today. Uh, especially in the cloud native ecosystem. I think uh, there are a lot of great challenges with doing trust in open source development and scaling all of that in cloud native, but there's also a bunch of opportunities here where we can start to close those trust gaps. Uh, you also can't talk about open source security without pausing to reflect on how much better it is than every other option we have. Um, it's hard, and I hate that we still have to do this, but every time you talk about some of the problems facing open source, you have to remind everyone just how bad the non-open source world is so you don't sound like you're saying cancel open source. Um, if any government regulators are in the room, I'm not saying cancel open source. <laughs> um, and then some uh, different techniques and innovation that's going on now in this space that can help us close that trust gap. So this is that metaphorical um, iceberg, right? Uh, this is what I mean by trust in open source. When you start writing a line of code, when you first start getting your first YAML set up for your Kubernetes application, you're building on top of millions and millions and millions of lines of other software written by tons of people. That is the, the iceberg below the surface. That's a beautiful thing, right? We have all of this digital commons that have been created by people over time. It's billions and billions of dollars of value that's just sitting there that you can start and pull from on the internet without having to pay anyone. It's frictionless. Open source enables all of that free innovation. Every study I've seen says 90 to 98% of all modern software um, in your application stack. So when you start writing code, when you start adding value, when you start writing your business logic for your users, 90 to 98% of that entire stack is open source. That means it's been written by other people not at your company that you have probably not paid. Um, that is what I mean by trust. You don't know who they are. You don't know what they're doing to that code. We just kind of have this blind trust that we've put into them that they're doing the right thing. Thankfully, in the history of computing, most people are genuinely good. Most people want to share their work, and most people don't take advantage of this. Um, but we can't rely on that completely, because attackers have noticed that, and they're starting to slip malware in there. They're starting to attack dependencies below that surface that you might not even realize are present. So not everyone is good. Even if most people on the internet are good, it doesn't take too many people to ruin that, uh, to ruin that digital commons, to poison it, to attack that trust and reputation that we've all built up and that we can take advantage of today. So here's the first uh, meme slide. Thank you, Lewis. <laughs> um, you can't really talk about the history of trust without looking at what Linux distributions have done. Linux distributions have been around for a while, and for some reason, we've kind of forgotten about how they all work in this cloud native and modern programming language world. Um, you also can't talk about any of this without talking about Ken Thompson's paper from 1984 called Reflections on Trusting Trust. 
This talk is about trust. That one has the word trust in it twice, so it must be relevant. <laughs> Um, if you've heard about this paper, if you haven't read it yet, I would highly recommend it. It's really short, kind of terrifying. Uh, but in short, what Ken Thompson showed in Bell Labs in 1984 uh, was that if you don't trust, if you haven't written and verified and compiled every line and every piece of software that goes into your stack yourself, um, and I don't think anyone here can claim that they've done that because it's just frankly impossible, then you can't have any trust in any modern computing. He did this in typical Ken Thompson Bell Labs fashion, where he put a backdoor into one of the compilers that their team used, uh, and that backdoor hid a backdoor in all the programs that it compiled. And then he pranked everyone else at the lab by printing out their password every time they ran a command. Uh, they tried to figure it out. They tried to debug it, because that's what they did. They dumped out all of the object code, and they couldn't find his backdoor, so they were baffled. Uh, but he was extra smart and took a couple extra steps and put a backdoor in the disassembler, too. So when you disassemble the program, it would hide the backdoor that was in the program itself. Um, so this was his uh, speech um, for the Turing Award Prize um, in 1984. And I think it just kind of terrified everyone, because we haven't done really anything about that since, close to 40 years ago. Um, we don't have any trust in modern computing. It's kind of what he showed. So how are we still computing today? Um, well, we just trusted each other anyway, even though there's no reason to. Um, Linux distributions have been a huge part of that. Um, the Debian project is close to 30 years old now, and most companies, uh, most enterprises today, are willing to just blindly trust these Debian maintainers for doing the right thing. Um, and that's not a bad decision. They've built up a reputation for trying to do the right thing over those last 30 years. They've gone to great lengths to do things like reproducible builds so that you can verify the same source code coming in is the same exact digest coming out, which prevents whole classes of attacks. They take this stuff very, very seriously so we can trust them, even though we have no actual reason or knowledge uh, that we should be able to do so. And that's amazing. That's what enables all this innovation on top of these layers, even though we have no real reason to believe in them. The trust comes from people in this case, not from systems or proofs or verification. Uh, and so that's what this trust was based on in the early days of Linux. Before this, before distributions came out, uh, source code was distributed. People didn't install opaque, massive binary artifacts. You downloaded the source code and compiled it yourself. This was done for a bunch of reasons. Uh, compiling is hard. Compiling for cross-platform stuff is even harder. We didn't have Docker to magically package all this up and let you ship it for different computers everywhere. Uh, so people got the source code themselves. It was easier to ship around. It was smaller. It was easier to download. Everyone had all of the source code for their applications that they were running on their computers sitting somewhere in the home directory of their early Unix machines. That was great for hacking. It was great for innovation. You could just change a couple lines of code and recompile it. But that doesn't scale. Compiling software is still hard even today with modern compilers and debugging and lint warnings. Compiling back then was much harder. If you want to give this a try, there's an awesome website, linuxfromscratch.com, that walks you through bootstrapping an entire Linux distribution, where you first build a compiler, a compiler that then you use to compile and cross-compile all of the other artifacts and get yourself a whole hermetic system compiled up from source. That is very hard for experts to do, um, let alone people just trying to use their computers every day. So it's very hard to scale. As a result of that, early Linux distributions started to appear. So the first two uh, in real history were Slackware and Debian, and they're still around in some form today. But they've kicked off a whole ecosystem of other Linux distributions. Um, they did that hard work of compiling binaries, compiling them for multiple architectures, getting them into distributable formats. But they also did more than that. Um, they took on the curation. They took on the maintenance. They took on the security guarantees of the programs they were distributing. If you get a program from Debian, you know that those maintainers have tested it against every other program in, in the platform. They've compiled everything. They've curated those versions. They're passing on security guarantees because they watch the vulnerability databases and they patch vulnerabilities for you. The distributions do more than just compiling. They actually aggregate all of that trust. And so you don't need to trust every single maintainer of every project that you're installing. You can trust that the Debian maintainers are doing a lot of that hard work for you. And by doing it once in a central place, that scales. That's, it. That's what enables us to scale those systems of trust and to scale the trust that we're placing in all of the open source packages that are part of Debian. Um, Early users didn't really have much else. Uh, the Debian maintainers tried hard to do this correctly, even though a backdoor in something like a compiled binary would be so much harder to detect than a backdoor in the source code. Um, so by doing that, by getting those trusted, tested systems, uh, it was easy off the bat, but it was a scary shift from a security perspective. Uh, but users had to follow that anyway. Um, this led to a bunch of scary revelations in the early 2000s that those backdoors could cause problems, that we were distributing artifacts over the internet before HTTPS was even around. Uh, people were just downloading things from FTP websites and mirrors that were set up all over to save on bandwidth costs. 
And that led to a bunch of development kind of around the same time in the early 2000s around secure package distribution. This is the documentation for the first version of APT, the package manager that you probably still use today, the early 2000s, that introduced secure mode, called secure apt, um, where the maintainers actually cryptographically signed all of the packages. So when they got distributed, when they got blown up all over the internet, uh, put on a thumb drive, just burned onto CDs or uh, floppy disks, you could verify that the package you got actually came from the Debian maintainers, even though you weren't obtaining it directly from them. Um, if you remember buying software at this time, you'd go to CompUSA or one of these similar stores, uh, and you'd walk out with a copy of the software in a box shrink-wrapped. That's how you knew that it came from the proper manufacturer. Open source was still new and the internet was still new, so you couldn't do that same thing in open source. You were just getting it from random websites without encryption um, and hoping that it was from the correct people. Um, and that's terrifying. So the maintainers fixed this. They built these new cryptographic trust systems so that when you downloaded something, if you found it on a disk on the internet or uh, found it on a disk on the sidewalk and plugged it into your computer, you could verify that it actually came from those maintainers. And this is what I mean by trust. Um, you trust the Debian maintainers and you want to be able to install a bunch of different packages. Well, first you have to make sure that the packages actually came from the Debian maintainers in order for that trust to actually be meaningful. Um, just because I trust a specific person, if I don't have any way to prove that the stuff I'm getting comes from that person, then that trust is somewhat meaningless. And the Debian maintainers take this system incredibly seriously. It's a distributed project uh, with people all over the world working on it. Um, and because of the trust that they've built up in the ecosystem and the trust that they've built up among the rest of the industry, they've had to do a very careful job uh, curating that trust in their own maintainer set. Um, they do a ton of vetting for new maintainers. Anyone can join the project and start contributing, but before you get permissions to push things into the Debian package repository, um, up until very recently, you had to meet a quorum of the other Debian maintainers in person and have them physically sign one of your GPG keys and verify your government ID. Um, this only changed during the COVID pandemic because people couldn't meet each other in person to do that government ID verification. So they rolled out a way to do that um, asynchronously or online. But they still know exactly who everyone that has push permissions to these repositories are so that you can build up those guarantees. Um, they are verifying uh, the integrity of the people contributing to Debian so you can trust those Debian maintainers for the packages that you install today. It would be incredibly terrifying and an incredibly juicy target if attackers got their hands on some of those signing keys. It's not just Debian. Most Linux distributions built up something like that, one of those trust mechanisms based on cryptographic signing or other forms of integrity checking, so that when you get their artifacts, you can verify it actually came from them. All of that hard work they do on the curation side only works if you can get your hands on it without it being tampered with or without, uh, with, well, knowing exactly where it came from. Uh, the signatures are checked when you install a package. And so if you're not too familiar with digital signatures, the way this works is the Debian maintainers have these things called private keys. The other Linux distributions do too. Red Hat has an incredibly similar system. Ubuntu has one based on Debian. Arch Linux has a similar one that they've built and rolled. Uh, but the maintainers of these packages have a, what's called a private key that they use to cryptographically sign all of the packages that they ship. So if you have their public key and you can get that in a bunch of different places, then you can verify the integrity of those packages and that they haven't been tampered with at installation time. So every Linux distribution has a system like this so that you can know exactly where the packages you got came from because they are the root of trust on most of your systems. The very first thing you install is that Linux distribution. Uh, so because that's such a juicy target, I've done a ton of work to harden it and to make that supply chain secure. This isn't new, it's been around for close to two decades now. But unfortunately, Linux distros and apt get install or yum install or apk install are not the only way that software is consumed today. In fact, it's getting less and less common. Um, that's leading to this trust gap. Um, as modern programming languages and things like Python and Node.js and Ruby uh, came out, they all built their own package managers that were similar to the ones from these Linux distributions. Fortunately, the trust model for these is completely different. If you run pip install numpy, uh, or apt-get install numpy, for example, this package is probably available in both, you're getting a completely different set of guarantees. Um, on the programming language package managers, you don't get that cryptographic signing. You don't actually even know where they're coming from. Um, any maintainer can upload anything to one of these package repositories. So even though the commands look and feel the same, the security guarantees and the trust guarantees you're getting are completely different implicitly. So that's where this gap has come from. Uh, Python's package index, we'll just pick on that one for a minute. Um, it came out in 2002, um, and it was called the cheese shop. It was based on a Monty Python sketch where somebody goes into a cheese shop and tries to buy cheese, um, and they can't get it. It's a pretty funny sketch. Um, so this was people trying to get Python programs, but they couldn't get them because they weren't available anywhere. Um, 
Python, I think, was the first one, but if you look in the history, CPAN from Perl came out around the same time, early 2000s. Uh, Ruby Gems came out shortly after, their package managers for PHP, and of course, the infamous NPM for Node.js came out a little bit later. But they all worked the same way, where anybody could sign up for an account, upload a package to a blank namespace, and now you're in charge of that package. Um, if you install any one of these packages, uh, they come from a whole bunch of sources. So if you install one package, it'll pull in its transitive dependencies for you automatically. That's super easy and super convenient, um, but now you're trusting thousands of people when you thought you were just trusting one person. Um, so with the cheese shop metaphor, you're going into a cheese shop and just buying something that doesn't actually come from that shop. Anybody could have put something there on that shelf and you're just picking it up. Um, this is what it looks like uh, when you go in there. You can type in any, any package name on Python, and it'll serve them to you all the same. Uh, you might be getting TensorFlow from Google, a company that puts a ton of work into this, but that project might be pulling in thousands of other lines of dependencies that come from people you don't trust. There is no central point of trust here in the Python ecosystem. There isn't, it's the same for every modern programming language. Then, of course, we jump forward into the cloud native ecosystem, where Docker is kind of sitting on top of all of these. Um, in some ways, we think of these infrastructure layers as sitting at the very bottom. But when you get a final container image, you're sitting all the way at the top of all of these other package managers. If you look at a Docker file, it might have app get install in it, but you're also probably going to have pip install and npm install, and you're wrapping all of these up into one unit. Uh, so you're inheriting all of the problems from all of the layers sitting below you. You don't have any way to actually guarantee the trust of the things that make it inside of that container after it's been built. Um, Linux distros solve that problem for part of it, but not all of it. Most software that you want to install into your final Docker images in this cloud native world uh, don't have guarantees. They don't have a place you can get them in a trustworthy manner. You can sign Docker images now. There's been a lot of work there, but there still haven't been uh, scaled distributions to package up all the software inside of them. And not to pick on Docker, but it's not even the final boss in this situation. Um, we have another package manager that sits on top of Docker in most of these cloud native uh, ecosystems called Helm, where it packages up sets of Docker images and sets of Docker containers. Um, there's an artifact hub maintained by the CNCF that packages up all of these Helm charts, which themselves are dozens of Docker containers with dozens or hundreds of programming language dependencies inside of them. Um, there's been a little bit of work here to add kind of that verified badge so you can tell who packaged up the Helm chart, but everything inside of that didn't come from that publisher. That publisher is just the final one that assembled all of the YAML. So it gets a little bit worse here because you're getting dozens and dozens of containers packaged from thousands of other maintainers inside of them. Um, this is why we can't have nice things. So the quick aside on open source security and why it is still good. <laughs> um, I often forget to talk about this, and I get criticized for it a lot. Um, none of this is meant to be a, an indictment on open source. It's the best that we have, and it's going to solve these problems because it has to. Um, all of these problems, all these security incidents, malicious packages, vulnerabilities in open source, um, these are handled so much better in open source than they would be in a closed source or in a different type of ecosystem. Um, you look at the biggest security disasters of the last couple decades, say log 4 shell or Heartbleed. These were resolved in days by the open source maintainers. It's just been weeks or months for companies and enterprises to f take in those fixes. So the problem with open source isn't in open source. It's in the way that enterprises consume it today. And that problem exists for open source or proprietary software. Um, this is uh, another fun meme that kind of puts this pr uh, in a perspective. Um, open source is 90 to 98% of all software, like we talked about. Um, but if you look at the exploited vulnerabilities list maintained by the US government, 90% of the vulnerabilities exploited in the wild are not in open source. Um, so 90% of the actual exploited vulnerabilities are in the 10% of code um, that isn't open source. So that's really where the problem lies. Um, one more time, it's really important to look at these as success stories, some of the biggest open source security uh, vulnerabilities in recent memory. log for shell Shellshock, Heartbleed. Um, these were all fixed in days uh, or hours by the maintainers of these projects. Um, but something like 70% of enterprises reintroduced vulnerable versions of Log4j in the year after it was fixed by the Log4j maintainers. Um, there's a lot of criticism on the 36-hour time period while they handled the initial disclosure. People are still dealing with that today on the order of years. Um, so the failing and challenge here comes on the other side. Enterprises have the problem with the way that they deal with all software, not just open source. All right, to wrap up, um, that trust gap uh, between Linux distros and modern programming languages and package managers, um, it's left two different problems. Um, one is that tamper-proof seal. Just because I trust you, if I find a package on PyPI or NPM, I don't have any way to guarantee that actually came from you. They don't have these cryptographic signing mechanisms in place. Um, that's a lack of that tamper-proof seal, the shrink wrap of the software that you used to get from CompUSA. 
Um, Linux distros built that. Um, other programming language ecosystems just haven't. There's been a bunch of work with SigStore and other signing systems um, in NPM and scaling those to package managers, but that's still new. Um, all of that trust is meaningless if I can't actually use that trust by verifying where I'm getting these artifacts. The second half of this uh, is the curation problem. Um, we're not curating software the same way that Linux distros used to. Uh, dependency trees get massive, uh, and we don't know who's in those dependency trees. All of that work that Debian does to check those government IDs, there's nothing like that in place for modern programming language uh, package managers, or Helm charts even, or Artifact Hub repositories, or Docker images. Um, we haven't baked in that curation. In the early days of Helm, there actually was an official Helm charts repository where there was a big group of maintainers that tested Helm charts and verified and built all of the containers inside of them. But they found that that couldn't scale, and they gave up on that after a couple of years and federated it back out. So now every Helm chart comes from a different GitHub repository with different practices in place for maintaining it. You need to solve both of these at the same time as we try to bridge that trust gap. Um, on the left, that is a depiction of a, a typical NPM <laughs> uh, package tree when you set up a Hello World application. You're trusting everyone the same. Everybody in your library uh, graph, everyone in your dependency tree has access to all of the permissions of the full application. Um, you can't fix that. You're never going to have one person in charge of every package there. There's millions of them. But you can start to converge around a smaller number of people that are curating parts of the ecosystem through hard work. It's not impossible. People just have to do it, and we have to be able to scale these systems of trust. Otherwise, companies aren't going to be able to continue to build on open source the same way that they have been. I'll wrap this up with one more quote about trust that I think is somewhat relevant here. Um, never trust anything that can think for itself if you can't see where it keeps its brain. Um, our computer programs can't actually think for themselves yet, but we have no idea where their brains are. We're trusting these things, and we have no idea who wrote them or who's responsible for maintaining them, but we're still throwing them directly into our production environments. So thanks again for having me today. <laughs>